Good morning. Nice to see all of you here. There's shenanigans going on up here. Um, I'm here to do the announcements today. First of all, letting you know, since tomorrow is Memorial Day, our offices will be closed. Um, and also for Memorial Day, City Youth have a really fun event planned for tonight. Great time to invite people. Um, Isaiah was kind of filling me in on some of the fun stuff that's going to happen, so that's tonight. Um, I'm using my really small print on my phone to be hip and cool like the guys, but it's, oops, I tipped it. You're not hip or cool. <laughs> Okay, the other thing that is coming up is our Big Wednesdays. Now, you may have seen this, hints about it in the bulletin or on the screen or maybe in our social media, but Big Wednesdays is a thing we're going to be doing this summer. Since technically life groups are not running through the summer, um, we're going to take four different days and have uh, time for us to connect here at the church. We are going to have a meal every time and then different fun events for all ages. It's a great time to connect, which was one of our core values, and to invite people for fun. This first one we're going to do is going to be June 29th, and it's going to be a worship night. We decided, since we can't trust the weather to do an outside activity in June, because you never know, we're going to do worship night. There will be activities for all ages because by then, well, whether or not, there will be activities for all ages. By then, Courtney will be here, who is our um, family pastor. Yes, we're really excited. So there's going to be fun things for the kids to do during that time that are age appropriate. Um, out in the, by the connect wall, Linda will be there if you want to register for that big Wednesday, or you can do it online. There's also other things that you can sign up for at the connect wall, like volunteering for Hamlin or signing up for prayer time. That's a good place to do it. Um, I think that's, that's all that's on my phone. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for this great opportunity to be here with your people, with um, a time to just honor you and worship you and lift up your name in praise. Thank you, Lord God. Amen. 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 Well, good morning, everyone. How are you all doing? Uh, let's stand up and worship the Lord this morning.
offering this morning as we finish worship. God, you are good. The battle does belong to you. You are good. Your name endures forever. Holy is your name, God. We praise you, Lord. We praise you. You are worthy. You are the good God. Amen. God, that is our prayer this morning, that we would experience the victory that you have for us, God, that you would come and fight our battles, whatever they are this morning, God, whatever our struggle is, wherever we're stuck, wherever we're encountering resistance from the enemy or just the circumstances of life, God, I pray that you would step into the middle of our circumstances and that you would fight for us. 
that you would be there. We would be experiencing a sense of your comfort, of your care, of your guidance and your provision. Be with us today and as we go through the week, God. Help us to learn how to lean on you, rely on you, how to get our power and our sustenance from you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, God. Amen. Thank you, church, for joining us in that time of worship. I encourage everybody, go ahead and be seated. Take a seat. Turn. Greet the people around you. Welcome them to church this morning. Maybe introduce yourself, and we will gather you back together in just a couple of minutes as we continue the service. Well, good morning, church. Again, welcome to Springfield Faith Center. If you're joining us online, welcome to you as well. We're so happy to have you with us. My name is Daniel. I'm one of the pastors here at church. I just get the opportunity and the pleasure to welcome everybody and say, I'm just really excited to see you here today. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, some of you know this already, but uh, this weekend and next weekend, Pastor Brandon and his wife, Sarah, are actually going to be gone. Um, this week is our denomination, the Foursquare denomination. Every year we have a big national conference, and it's this coming week, and it's in Orlando. So they're on a plane right now. So if you feel like praying for them at some point today just for a safe travel and stuff, they have their boys with them, and I don't envy them that at all. I'm going to be flying out uh, later today to go join them in Orlando. So we're going to be we're going to be gone this week. So today and next week, you guys are actually going to have some special guest speakers in-house, and I'll introduce ours in just a second. But before I do... I just want to say a quick word because this weekend is Memorial Day weekend. And, and I just want to encourage everybody, enjoy the weekend. Do your barbecues tomorrow. Go camping. Do all the things that normally go along with Memorial Day weekend. But as you do, can we remember the purpose of the weekend to honor the men and women who've given their lives in defense of our country and the kind of nation that we have? Yeah. And, and I know when... When you talk to veterans and active service members, they consistently say Memorial Day is not about us. Don't make it about the folks who are in serving right now. It's about the folks who've come before, the folks who've made the sacrifice and helped to create. Our country is not perfect, but it is pretty awesome, okay? And the part of the, a big part of the reason that it is the country that it is and I get the, to live in the place that I do is because of their sacrifice and because of what's been fought for before this. So as we do our weekends, as we enjoy our time, as we enjoy the day off, just keep that in mind and, and remember what this weekend represents for us. Can we do that together? Okay. So it is my pleasure this morning. We do have a special guest speaker. He's, uh, yeah. yeah. So for those of you who know Pastor Paul Blanchard, can you welcome him up to the stage? He's going to share with us today. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Just don't call me PP. Pee -pee. Um, <laughs> hey, before uh, before I get started on my message, hey, I just wanted to to um, to highlight something. Um, last week, uh, Bill McDonald came up and and gave an impassioned plea to get some help to help for people to come and help out at uh, Hamlin. Um, I just wanted to, to just reinforce uh, just the special relationship that we have with Hamlin. And this is not something that uh, we should take lightly. There are a lot of other churches that are really longing to establish the kind of relationship that we have the privilege of having with Hamlin. And uh, they are trying to get into other schools, and other schools are a little hesitant to, to allow a, a church to have the kind of relationship that we have fostered with them. And uh, last weekend, uh, so they have a, a couple of different things that they have going on that they need help 
for uh, to to kind of graduate the the outgoing eighth graders uh, to promote them into their new uh, into new grades. Um, so they're needing ten people to help out at each one of these different activities. Last week he had two people sign up, and so I'm begging you. I'm begging you, please, uh, go talk to Bill after the service. Uh, go, uh, go see him. Get signed up. Let's make sure that Ham- Hamlin uh, Middle School knows that the SFC is a church that cares for them. Okay? All right. That's enough I'll say about that. Okay. So, then my family just showed up. <laughs> see every- Hi, Paul's family. Just in time. Um, So my family and I have just finished up a a very, very busy time in our lives. Um, In fact, uh, when uh, Pastor Brandon asked me if I wanted to go uh, to the the conference in Orlando, I was like, please, no, not another thing. (laughs) I've had too much. Uh, but in April, uh, my uh, youngest daughter and her new husband just got married. It was beautiful. And I loved being a part of it. I won't embarrass him any further than that. Um, but uh, uh, a, ma- a wedding is, is enough. I mean, it, that's busy enough. But then Kelsey and my son-in-law, Tony... They moved into my house. So that's, so there we, we you know, the, fall, the, the next day after the wedding, when they, we started moving them in. So there was no rest for the weary. <laughs> Break next beat. Let's just get this thing done. And then I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> I, am, I am a moron beyond all morons. <laughs> I uh, decided to... Let's, uh, hey, we can do this. Let's uh, schedule a men's retreat in the midst of all of this stuff. <laughs> so I, so th- this entire time, you know, just so focused on getting, trying to get everything done that we needed to get done. I was like, don't talk to me. Don't, don't bother me. I got to do this. You know, there was very little time in the margins to focus on doing anything else for anybody else. And I was, you know, at times getting a little irritable, you know, just like stay in focus. So if I got a little irritable at any of you, please accept my apology. But um, today we're going to talk uh, about a portion of scripture where you kind of see the enormity of Jesus' schedule and kind of see that things got kind of busy and and how the, how the disciples handled this. So if you have your Bibles, uh, turn to Mark chapter 6. We're going to be in verse 30 through 44. Mark chapter 6, verse 30 through 44. Okay. And I promised Chris, who's doing the camera, I like to usually go around to all these different places, and, but I told him I'd, I'd try to stay right here so he doesn't have to do a whole bunch of camera. I'll give him my best shot, Chris, I promise. Uh, okay, so, uh, starting at verse 30. The apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour. And every time I read that, I, I think, you know, like the bus with the big logo on the side, you know, they're coming back. Anyway, they're coming back from their big ministry tour. And told him all that they had done and taught. Then Jesus said, hey, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. He said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. So they left by boat for a quiet place where they could be alone. But many people recognized them and saw them leaving. And the people from many towns ran ahead along the shore. I mean, they're not even letting them get out of their sight. They're following. Okay, we're just going to, okay, I see them out there. They're just following along the shore. They got to land someplace. They just can't stay in the middle of the lake all day. Um, So uh, following along the shore and got there ahead of them. 
Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. So think, what must Jesus' daily planner must look like? I mean, he is constantly on the move, constantly moving from this town to next, you know, preaching in the synagogues, preaching to the people, healing people. He's also being, he's sought after everywhere he goes. People want a little bit of piece of time, a little bit of piece of Jesus. I want, I want to get to that guy so I can get healed from this malady that I'm having. He's constantly being, being bombarded with people. And not only that, he's, got a, he's being hounded by all these religious hypocrites that are wanting to catch him. In, in, so he's constantly having to have his guard up and know, like know what to say. It sounds exhausting to me. So the, Jesus, uh, the disciples, they return from their ministry tour and they just want to have some time to rest. They want to tell Jesus about all the experiences that they've, they've had uh, during this tour, all the things that they've done uh, in the name of God. You know, they want to brag a little bit. They want to look, look at the stuff that we did here, Jesus. You know, you sent us out. We, you know, we did it. They want to get some approval from their rabbi. They went to Jesus for his like on their Facebook post. And Jesus, he wants to hear all about it. He, he wants to, oh, that, sound, that sounds so great, guys. Let's, let's go off together. And I got this great idea. We'll go off together. We'll get some barbecue. You know, we'll sit around the campfire for a while, and we'll just talk. But, and they don't even take time to eat. They, start, they get in the boat, and they start rowing out. But the people, the people don't take the hint. They recognize him and they start following him right along the shoreline. And I would have been like, hey, you know, um, could you leave us alone? You know, we got, we, we're looking for some time to spend together and, you know, just give us a little bit of space. But not Jesus. There is not a hint of irritation, not a hint of impatience. Jesus saw them and he had compassion on these people. And he makes a, it makes a, an amazing statement. It says, they were like sheep without a shepherd. The word uh, had compassion in the Greek be, uh, means, is translated to, uh, to have the bowels yearn. It's a deep-seated longing to care for. I mean, I can't think, you know, Daniel and I were talking about this, you know, can't think of the last time that I felt that way. You know, where I just felt butterflies in my stomach because I really wanted to care for this person. Um, but he also says, like sheep without a shepherd. And it got me thinking, what happens to sheep when there's no shepherd? So I found this interesting website called farmingbase.com. And it says that sheep cannot live without the shepherd. They are entirely dependent on the shepherd for everything. They require constant care and watching over, so leaving them unattended can put them at risk and greatly endanger their lives. They are prone to follow other sheep into hazardous territory, and sometimes they'll follow each other right over a cliff. They just follow each other around with no thought of, uh, thought of danger in mind, just get their nose in the rear end of the, of the sheep in front of them. Without a shepherd, it also becomes hard for a, a sheep to find pasture and water, which they require for survival. Another instance is that they may get attacked by predators. Also, if, if sheep have no shepherd, their wool overgrows. It becomes matted, heavy, dirty, and is infected with parasites. This infects them with diseases and internal worms, which may reduce their survival rate. Without a shepherd, their hooves are uncared for, which make it hard for them to even move. You know, I'm thinking through this list, and I was like, man, we're not far removed. <laughs> you know, 
Maybe that's the reason why we're called sheep in the Bible, because sheep are the dumbest animals on the face of the planet. But a sheep needs a shepherd. And Jesus is seeing these people, and he's having compassion for them. He's having his bowels yearn for these people. And he just wants to shepherd them. So this brings me to my first point. Ministry opportunities happen outside of our own agendas. The Bible says that the enemy prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So as we are seeking to be shepherded and we are seeking to be conformed to his likeness and he's wanting to to transform us into people who can be a shepherd to others, then our senses need to awaken to rescue and to serve. And the fact is that this does not happen when it's convenient. It doesn't always happen when we have extra time on our hands on a Saturday. This usually happens when we're managing our own to-do list, when we're trying to get things done. So what we need to do is we need to keep our eyes open. We need to keep our eyes open to, to the possibilities, to the opportunities. And folks, there's opportunities everywhere. Everywhere we look, we get so caught up with blinders on, so, so focused on the myopic points of our lives that we miss what's going on around us. It doesn't have to be some big, grandiose thing that you, you, know, you spend years trying to wrap your head around, okay, what is God calling me to do? And it's like, okay, now I know what that is. All right, now I'm going to spend the next several years preparing for this. You know, and, you know, getting, th- you know, getting all the right books in order and, and all that stuff. And then, you know, it's going to take a little while before we actually launch, you know. And it, it doesn't have to be that way. Opportunities are right outside your door right now. It's sitting next to you. I have this little game that I play at Jerry's every time I go there. And I'm a woodworker, so I'm at Jerry's a lot. Um... But I've talked about this before, but I think it fits well well with this. So I have this game that I play at Jerry's, that whenever I pull into Jerry's parking lot, the moment that I open the door and close it and I walk on, I'm setting foot on the parking lot, I'm looking for an opportunity for somebody that might need some help. It could be somebody that needs some help loading stuff into their trunk. It could be in the store when I, you know, someone is like, wandering around aimlessly, trying to decide, you know, figure out, you know, do they need a two by four or a two by six? You know, it's, it's like, just, I'll look for that, that person. I had this, uh, this lady that I was, uh, that I saw there just this last week. Uh, She was in the checkout line in front of me. She had a couple of bags of, of uh, soil in her cart and, and, um, she was like, oh, you know, this is so heavy. She was telling the checkout person, uh, this is so heavy. Can you get somebody to come and help me load this in? And I was like, oh, opportunity. And I was like, oh, no, man, man it's okay. I, I can help you. I'm, I'm just about, you know, just let me check out, and I'll follow you out to your car, and I'll help you load up. And she said, oh, really? Are, are you sure? Like, yeah, no problem. It's not a big deal. And uh, so I followed her out to her car, and she said, oh, this, this, these bags are so heavy, and I just don't know. And I went, you know. And she goes, well, look at you. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, the good Lord blessed me with strength. I might as well use it. So, so I loaded all of her stuff into her trunk, and, and uh, then I, uh, I grab her cart, and I'm, you know, tell you, well, I said, ma'am, you have a great day. And she said, oh, no, I'll take care of the cart. Oh, it's not a problem. It's, uh, it's not a big deal. You would have thought that I had changed the world's axis. And all I did is help to load a few things into her trunk. You just look for those opportunities. And I had things I had to do. I had, you know, I went to Jerry's for a reason. But folks, it's just time. 
That's all it is. It's just a, a few extra moments. It's, and what that meant for that lady. You know, just the fact that there's somebody else that cares in the world. So just offer a little bit of time. But your eyes need to be open to the possibilities. And focusing on what is God doing right here, right now, and act to be part of the solution. So that's point one. So let's continue on with the text. Verse 35. Late in the afternoon, his disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that we can go to, so that they can go to the nearby uh, farms and villages and buy something to eat. But Jesus said, you feed them. <laughs> with what, they asked. We have to work for months to earn, that, uh, earn enough money to buy food for all these people. Well, how much bread do you have? Jesus asked. Go and find out. I think it's amazing. He gives them a task. It's not just, okay, just sit back. I'll take care of it. He gives them a task. They came back and reported, we have five loaves and two fish. Then Jesus told the disciples to have the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they, uh, so they sat down in groups of 50 or 100. Jesus took the five loaves and two fish, looked up towards heaven and blessed them. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he kept giving the bread to the disciples so that they could distribute it to the people. He also divided the fish for everyone to share. And they all ate as much as they wanted. And afterwards, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftover bread and fish. A total of 5,000 men and their families were fed. I always thought about how cool it would have been to see the disciples holding their baskets and saying, Jesus put it in and all of a sudden, kill, <laughs> you know. But, you know, I'm thinking, you know, so the disciples at this point, when he, then they go to Jesus and they say, you know, okay, let, let's send these people away so they can get, I imagine that they're getting a little irritable. You know, I'm, I'm imagine, I imagine that they, uh, you know, it said that in the, earlier that they didn't even take time to eat. I imagine they've moved away from hungry and they're now, they're full on hangry. <laughs> and they've had to postpone their opportunity just to chill with Jesus tell the stories about their trip. Instead of sitting around a campfire, snacking on barbecue, it's just now turned into just another day of crowd control. Jesus, send them away. Let them get food so we can get some food. And then we can get back to our plans. Jesus says, you feed them. Earlier uh, this week, we got together um, to talk about ser uh, in our regular service uh, planning meeting, and uh, Pastor Dan offered up a thought that you know I didn't hadn't really occurred to me at the time. Uh, but what was Jesus expecting when he said that to them? You know, I know that uh, you know when he says, "No, you feed them." I know that that's something that they weren't expecting. They weren't planning on him going there. I think that the, whoever uh, actually put in the, the uh, punctuation, they missed an opportunity when they said with what and just putting a question mark. They should have put an exclamation point there too because it's like, with what? We don't have anything. Remember that um, when Jesus said this, he wasn't just being cute. He wasn't being facetious. He wasn't being sarcastic. He knew that the disciples could do this. He knew that if they had faith, they could do this. And remember also that the disciples had just returned from this tour. By, their, by all accounts, everything had gone great. 
They, they, they had really had a successful time, and they were excited about this, and they were ready for some time of show and tell. But Jesus knew that his disciples could do this. Why? Because they saw the problem. They saw the enormity of the situation. There's all these people, and they're all getting hungry, and there's not enough food in this area, and, and it's getting late. Henry Blackaby, several years ago, wrote a book called um, Experiencing God. And one of the things that he said in this book was that whenever you recognize a problem, that that is actually God inviting you to be a part of the solution. So the disciples saw the problem but didn't recognize that this was an invitation to be part of the solution. I did a little little math here. It says that there was over a total of 5,000 men and their families fed. When you look at that, uh, back in the time of of Judea, uh, the average size of a family was 4.6 people. So you take 5,000 men, times that by 4.6 people, you get 23,000 people. 23,000 people that were fed here. That's, you take Austin Stadium full on with a, with the, uh, a full on f- a football game and you feed half of those people. That's how many people were fed on that day. Fed. But Jesus knew that they needed to enlarge their expectation. They needed to realize that God is so much bigger than basic needs. And so he set them up. That brings us to point number two. We are called to encourage one another into audacious acts of faith. There are always giants in front of us the entire world is going to make sure of that. They're mocking us for how puny we are, that we have nothing to offer. What would happen if we were to actually encourage one another to, like David, pick up the stones and say, this can't stand? I'm going out and we're going to to take down this giant. What are the areas in your life when you say something should be done? That's your giant. That's your invitation to God. Edward Everett Hale was a uh, a 19th century, uh, he was a, a teacher. He was a historian, an American author, and also a minister. And he said, I am only one, but I am still one. I cannot do everything, but I can still do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do the something that I can do. We need to have the faith, and we need to encourage each other to have the faith to be able to stand and say, you don't worry about this Philistine. I'll go out and fight him. That brings us to point number three. Don't worry about what you don't have. Offer what you do. The number one uh, objection or excuse that I hear uh, with folks that I minister to uh, and for not stepping into areas of ministry is feeling inadequate. I don't have enough Bible knowledge. I don't speak very well my past failures exclude me from being able to do this. Folks, we all struggle with these things. Every single one of us struggles with these things. Dave Lanning used to tell me that, uh, that he would get butterflies in his stomach every single time that he would stand up here and preach. He showed me his, his computer one time that he kept every single one. I mean, we're talking hundreds and thousands of messages. 
And every single time that he got up here to speak to you, he had butterflies in his stomach and was, was wanted, wanted to make sure that he, he did a good enough job. I could spend the next five hours standing in front of you, regaling you with stories of how I feel insecure and, and don't feel adequate. Uh, John Eldritch in his book, Wild at Heart, states that most of the time when you meet a man, what you're actually meeting is an elaborate fig leaf. Fig leaf is a facade. It's a, fa- a false self that we put in, uh, we, we establish so that it, uh, it hides, it, it masks the, the person that we're, we believe that we are so that we feel more capable, more competent. And uh, we do this to manage risk, to, to keep ourselves uh, to manage risks and, and not jeopardize the, uh, our, our, own, our own world and not jeopardize our placement of our fig leaf and be exposed for a, for, to be a fraud and, and show the world that we don't have what it takes. But the problem with that is that we act in one uh, of two ways we'll either stay living in a really, really small story where we, we don't do anything because we're afraid that we're going to be exposed. We don't stand up and say, no, I can't, I can't let this stand. Or we go the other way and we turn into a bully. And we try to manage our world through fear. And that just destroys people but it's all in an effort to try and manage our, manage our world around us. So all these things do is keep us living in a small story and we go around judging our insides based on other person's outsides. What that means is that I, as I'm thinking you know, about who I am and I'm going, oh man, I'm, I'm such a low life. I could never be like Tim, who's just this mountain of, of the faith. He, he's, he's got so much going on, and I could never be as, as good of a man as Tim is. But the problem is that he's thinking the same thing. He's got the same insecurities, and he's thinking, oh, I could never be like Paul. And in the meantime, we're trying to manage our world based on a false self, we need to encourage each other to get past that and be the true self that God has called us to be. And don't you see that by doing all of this, what the world is doing is, is, is the world has us operating as sheep without a shepherd. We're just chasing our own tails. We're just following others towards the path of the destruction. We're just... We're not listening for the shepherd's voice. But the fact is, folks, is that we are all sheep. Every single one of us are sheep. I'm a sheep. You're a sheep. Everyone's a sheep sheep. (laughs) But we have a good shepherd. And we can encourage our fellow sheep to come. We can encourage our fellow sheep to join the herd, to stay in the herd, and to re- help each other to recognize the shepherd's voice. So don't worry about what you don't have. Offer freely what you do have. It's God's job to multiply it. We think ourselves as such small apples. There's a, there's a quote uh, that is just coming to my mind here uh, that uh, I, think, I believe it's Shakespeare um, where he says something has puddled in his good mind where he has made himself ens- enslaved to what is that which is less than himself when greatness is his destiny. I'm paraphrasing that <laughs> badly and probably butch- butchering it. But the fact is, is that we have been called 
We have been called to, not to mediocrity, but to greatness in the faith. I can't tell you how many times I have had guys come to me and said, Paul, you've changed my life. And I'm like, well, I didn't do anything. God can do so much with the little that we have to offer. You don't know how much God can do with your little puny five loaves of bread and two fish. Offer them. Give them. Keep your eyes open for what God is doing right now. And let him have the time. It's just time. I have two questions for you and then we'll wrap up. How can you encourage others into audacious acts of faith? Acts of faith where God has got to show up. When, God, when Jesus says that we have faith of the mustard seed, we can tell that mountain to move and it'll move. How many of us actually believe that it will? You know, let's encourage each other to say, come on, we can do this. God says we can do it. How can you partner with God and love your brother and sister enough to call out dreams? Dreams of what they can be for God. Dreams that are so big that God has to come through it to, in order to move those dreams into reality. Question number two. What do you have right here, right now, that can be offered to God for the sake of others? You have to be proactive. This isn't something that's going to just fall in your lap if your not, eyes aren't open. It's not ma magic jelly bean fields. It's something that you have to think, okay, I'm going to go out there and that's going to be my mission field. That's where I'm going to keep... You know, it's like when you uh, notice a car for the first time that you really like. What happens after that? You see that car everywhere. And it's like, where was my eyes before this? Open your eyes to the opportunities that God is laying at your feet right outside your door right this moment that you can say, I'm going to give what I have. Think this through. Look for the opportunities. Be ready. Be prepared. Give it away. Watch God move. It's his job to move. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you, us stupid, puny little sheep, that you have called us to greatness, that you have called us to, to, uh, to carry your mission to this world, and that you have, you have, you have gone all in on this plan. And it's our job to move into it, Lord. It's our job to, to connect with you and see what you're doing right here, right now. And Lord, even though we sometimes lack the courage to act on it, I pray that you would put into our lives friends that can call that, that out in us. And that we can do the same thing for them. We offer all of this to you, God. The author of our faith. You have called us, and you say in your word that we are your masterpiece. Created before the beginning of the world to do the good works that you have called us to do. So Lord, we offer this to you. And we thank you, Jesus. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Have a wonderful Memorial Day, folks.